So I'm sure most of you have attended some sporting event, like a high school football or volleyball game or a college basketball game maybe, or my favorite, an Astros baseball game, preferably away games. But you, but you know that moment when that go-ahead point is scored or a home run is hit and, and the whole crowd goes wild? Y'all know that time? It's, it's like electric in the stadium, isn't it? It's just everybody is jumping up and down out of their seats. Their arms are raised. They're yelling. They're screaming. And in those moments, we are literally praising our team with our shouts of affirmation are clapping, are jumping, and even high-fiving people that are complete strangers that are sitting next to us, right? All of that, I know the players appreciate because it helps them when they hear that at a boy or at a girl because it drives them to continue to do better, right? It just inspires them to keep going. Well, thinking about that made me wonder... How would God feel if we got just as excited when offering him praise as we do at some of our crazy baseball games? To be honest, I used to struggle with the question of how to praise God. I found it easy to think about thanking God. And a lot of the time, praise and thanksgiving, you know, go together. I had to actually step back and think about the actual definition for praise, which is this, to express warm approval or admiration of or pay tribute to. So then I thought, besides God, who would I have been expressing warm approval or admiration of or paying tribute to? Well, there were my kids, you know, when they brought that report card home that had an A-plus on it, I would praise them. Or if I had a colleague that had done something really well when they were leading teachers, I can easily praise my husband when he creates something beautiful out of wood. He's really good at it. So then this helped me understand that I could, I would, and I should be praising God for so many things. Just like there are lots of ways for us to praise our favorite sports teams, there are lots of ways we can praise God. Did you know there's actually seven Hebrew words of praise for, that describe ways we can praise God? Some of you may have heard these before, but if you haven't, they may help you develop a different way or different way to think about praising God and maybe even draw your praise deeper. So let's take a look at some of these words. The first one is shabak. Shabak means to shout, to address in a loud tone, to command, to triumph, kind of like they did when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, right? Shabak. And then there's another one, it's called toda, not tada, toda. Toda means express visible thanks or adoration to God by extending the hands to God in reverence coupled with an offering a sacri- of a sacrifice or praise to God. That's why you see the lamb there, because in the Old Testament days, they sacrificed a lamb, right? That was one of the ways they praised God. Zamar. Zamar means to pluck the strings of an instrument, to sing praise. So when Manny's up here playing his guitar, that's Zamar. King David did that when he played his lyre. He strummed those strings, and he was praising God through them. Tehillah. I did not say tequila. Tehillah means to sing or to laud, perceived to involve music, especially singing hymns of the Spirit of praise. So this is in our traditional worship, and after communion, we hold hands and raise them and sing on eagle's wings. Some of you have done that with us before. Tehillah. Tehillah. Yada. Yada means to lift the hands. Simply lift the hands. Yada. And then there's Barak. Barak means to kneel down, to bless God as an act of adoration or to salute. And then finally, Halal. 
Halal has a lot of different things it can mean. To be clear, to praise, to shine, to boast, to rave, celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. So halal is the base word for the word hallelujah. And at the end of the word hallelujah, yah, that comes from Yahweh or God. So when we put those two together, hallelujah means to be clamorously foolish in response to Yahweh or God. You might be wondering why I'm sharing all these Hebrew words with you this morning and these meanings, but let me help make a connection. Our scripture for today is from the Gospel of Luke, and it begins like this. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when, they saw, when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. So the reason Jesus told the men to go show themselves was to the priest wasn't because he didn't want them to come closer. Ben Heise did the children's sermon this morning. He, he talked about it being the, the first social distancing. <laughs> so it wasn't about social distancing. It was about Levitical law. So you may remember, because I know you love reading the book of Leviticus, that God told Moses and Aaron that when someone had a skin rash, they were to go to the priest and have the priest look at it and They would examine it, and then they would pronounce whether or not the person was clean or unclean. So Jesus was merely following Jewish law, all the while knowing when they walked away, they would be healed. So as I continue reading the rest of our passage for today, I'd like for you to pay attention to the word praise, okay? One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give, God pray, to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Did you catch that? Only the one man who was a Samaritan, came back and praised God. Remember, Samaritans didn't like Jews, and that is why the scripture points this out and lets us know that he's the one who returned. Let me ask you, if you were watching this scene play out, what do you think it looked like when the Samaritan returned to Jesus? Did he just stroll back over to Jesus and said, hey, thanks for changing my life. Appreciate it. And then just turn around and be on his way? No, that's not what he did at all. It says in the scripture, he threw himself down at Jesus' feet and thanked him. My guess is that this went on for a few minutes before Jesus said, that's enough. Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Another point. Did you notice that Jesus doesn't touch these men like he did when he healed another man with leprosy that we read about earlier in Luke in chapter 5? The scripture says this, While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Jesus not touching the men is important because the men had to show their faith. They had to show their faith in him when they turned and walked away toward the priest. Also in this story that we're talking about of healing, I read to you, it, it, the healing isn't meant to be the focus, folks. That's not the main point. The main point is the man who returned and his heart. All the men were healed, but only one returned to thank God and praise him. 
So I'm sure that there was more than one Hebrew word that would describe this man's praise to God. But Shabbat, that's the one where you have to shout, right? The scripture said the man came back praising God in a loud voice. He wasn't being nonchalant about it. He was happy. He was praising God with a loud voice. And then Barak, he threw himself on his knees, bowing down in front of Jesus. Can you see it? And then Halal. The man was praising God and may even have been acting clamorously foolishly. He was happy. His whole life has changed. He hadn't been able to be with his family, with his children, whoever he was, whoever was there for him. He couldn't be with them because the culture made them go away. There was no cure for this. And so he was happy because he was going to get to go back to his family. Halal, hallelujah. There's 165 times that the word halal appears in 140 scriptures in the Old Testament. One of those times is in the book of 2 Samuel. This is the story of King David when he's bringing the ark of the Lord back into the city of David. And he is worshiping and praising God. It says this, Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. So when King David goes home, McCall, did you happen to catch who she was? The former King Saul's daughter? Anyway, she gives David a hard time about how he was praising God and the way he had done it. He had embarrassed her. So she scolds him and tells, and then he tells her this. He says, I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. In other words, he didn't care. He did not care what he looked like to her or anyone else at all. He didn't care because he was offering his own praise to God, and he was coming to God with a humble heart. Some of you are familiar with Chris Tomlin, and he says this. He has a book called Holy Roar. And in the book, he says, True halal contemplates laying aside your inhibitions and killing your self-consciousness. Laying aside your inhibitions and killing your self-consciousness. I think that's what King David did. He set aside those inhibitions, and he went for it. And he did it with a heart full of praise for God. The God who was right there with him in that ark. When you come to this space for worship, are you like the Samaritan man who is kneeling at the feet of Jesus? Or like King David dancing and clapping and singing praises to God? When you worship God, folks, We need to make sure our self-consciousness isn't put above Jesus. We should enter this time of worship with praise and thanksgiving and from a place of humility in our hearts. Here's what I want you to think about, friends. Praise is not about you. Praise is an act of obedience And is in response to what God has done in our lives. Maybe you're not comfortable raising your hands in the air when we sing songs of praise. Or or kneeling in submission at the side of your bed when you're praying to God. I'm not asking you to do something new just because Pastor Ramona said you should set aside your inhibitions. No. No. What I'm asking you to do is examine your heart and your soul when you're worshiping God. Ask yourself, is this for my comfort or for his praise? 
also don't want you to think that if the person next to you is in a spirit of yada, raising their hands, that you have to do it too just because they are. Here's a few questions I do want you to reflect on, though. Why do you come to church? Are you thinking about catching up with friends or where you'll go for lunch afterwards? Or have you spent time preparing your hearts for worship? Do you walk through the door thinking about all the things that happened during the week that you need to thank God for? So many times God's graciousness is often ignored and unappreciated by many of us, just like the nine lepers who walked away and they didn't come back to praise God and thank him for their gift of healing. We have so many things Folks, we have so many things to be thankful and and, and to praise God for. Primarily the gift of eternal life that has been secured for us by the cross. Not to mention the gratitude we should have for all the blessings we have in our lives. And our worship should be genuine and authentic. As we approach this Thanksgiving holiday, I'd like to encourage you to take some time to reflect on things that you have to be grateful to God for. And then to think about how you will take that and offer him praise for those gifts. Now, I know that when things aren't going well in our lives, that sometimes it's hard to find things to be thankful for. But friends... I'm just going to encourage you to start with the little things. It doesn't have to be anything big. Thank you for helping me wake up this morning. Thank you that I can walk. (laughs) Thank you for the little things, right? The next week when you come to church, be ready to offer tequila, not tequila, or halal to our almighty God. And show him that not only do you have faith in him, but unlike the other nine lepers, you and I will be the ones that come back and return to offer our praise to him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you alone are worthy of our praise. You alone, Lord, are the one that we need to sing hallelujah to, to bow down on our knees to, to raise our hands, yada, to. And Lord God, we ask that you would open our eyes, give us wisdom and discernment about the ways that we should be praising you. Help us push the distractions aside when we're in this place to worship you. And Lord, help us to always have an attitude of gratitude, especially for the gift of your son on the cross for us. Father, we ask you all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.